Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Monday, January the 2nd, 2023. It is currently 9, 12 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, multiple times today, in fact, I, I don't want to I don't want to exaggerate, I don't want to use any hyperbole, but probably 20 times today, maybe 25 times today, I have opened the door to the studio, walked up the stairs, sat down in the chair right here in front of this microphone, and said, okay, I, I need to go live. I need to do another live broadcast. Oh, but I don't. I don't want to because I but because I've been conflicted, right? It's 2023, right? So I should be thinking of what is new, what is ahead of us. I should be making plans about what I want to accomplish in 2023, but I feel like I'm trying to I'm trying to move forward into 2023, but I feel like I'm dragging this like thousand pound weight, right? Because I feel like there's some things left over in 2022 that I haven't that I, I didn't really complete correctly. I didn't finish it in any in, in a decent way, in a good way. And one of those is our series that we are calling. In fact, if you look, if you look on uh, the Church One app or the Sermons 2.0 app and look for the series, practice the presence of God. Practice the presence of God, which has been a crazy series if you follow everything that happened. It started in the Today's Focus podcast series, and then it transitioned from that over to this series called Practice the Presence of God. It involved sermon reviews. It involved so many different things. And then it involved an article written at the Christian Post about the presence of God. And it's been a it's been a crazy journey. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I reached a point in our discussion about it that I felt in a sense that I kind of lost the plot. I lost the narrative and I felt like that. I felt like what, what more? I mean, I, I need to finish going through all the points of this article, but in some ways, what's the point of doing that other than to say I finished the series. So in some ways I was like, I'm just going to forget it. I'm just going to move on. And, and you know, no one's going to care. I mean, the holidays have happened. Everyone's already, everyone's probably already forgotten that series. They've moved on with their life. But I'm sitting here going, but I can't let it go. I can't let it go. I didn't finish it. I didn't finish it. I mean, when you say there are five things that hinder the presence of Christ, according to this article, and you haven't covered all five, then it's just glaring that you didn't finish it, that you just stopped. Now, I don't know. Is there any shame in that? I, well, I just felt like it, that, that the series had lost its momentum, that we'd lost the plot, we lost the narrative, however you want to describe it. And I made, I made a calculated decision to just forget it. And, and I, I think most people would just be okay with that, but I couldn't. So all day I've walked up here going, okay, it's 2023. What do I do? What do I do today? What, what broadcast needs to be done? Right. And well, for the, for the, uh, today's focus, we're still working on something from 2022. So that's a little, that's a little frustrating, right? Now we kind of got a little reprieve because I responded today to an email received in 2023. So that was 2023 type thing. But then I was like, okay, so now what do we do in 2023? And then I was like, but, but, but that presence of, of God, that the presence of Christ series, it, it's just like, it just keeps whispering. You didn't finish the series. You didn't finish the series. So I, so finally, after tr t well, I would walk up here, have this back and forth myself, walk back downstairs, walk back upstairs, get, get frustrated because I, because in some ways I don't want to talk about this ever again. All right. All right. Now, someone who is very encouraging just said the series is really great. Wouldn't want it to disappear unfinished. Okay, well, well, thank you for saying that, but I, I kind of want it to disappear because I've kind of grown, I, I I've kind of just grown frustrated with this series. I really have I, because I feel like if you if you listen to the end of twenty, if, if, if it's funny, if 
it, it's always funny. And I was doing this the other day. I was going back to like the first few episodes of 2022 and then listening to the, some of the last episodes of 2022. And just by the time I got to the end of 2022, if you listen to a lot of the broadcasts, you heard that there was a theme emerging. And that was my just, I was exhausted and frustrated and discouraged. Just, I, 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 I just, I just couldn't take any more of what I feel is Christian doublespeak. This just Christians say one thing and then they say another thing. We we listen we listen to that crazy series that was that that well that crazy series of sermon reviews about a sermon that was supposed to be about Matthew fourteen where they didn't mention Matthew fourteen where we can do it but we are enslaved but we're not really enslaved we volunteer to be enslaved but we cannot volunteer to be unenslaved and then, but we have to do this and do this and we do this to get the power it, uh, it's it's just craziness and all of the the double speak when it comes to. Uh, you know, salvation, the double speak when it comes to so many things within the Christian world. They they say one thing and then they try to, then they backtrack. And it's just, I, I'm just, I was just exhausted. I'm just tired of it. I just, it just, I, I don't know how I ended up by the end of the year, just so tired of just Christian talk. I, how can I say, I, I know that sounds horrible, but I just grew tired of listening to Christians say one thing and then say another thing that completely contradicts what they just said. And they can't see the contradiction. They can't see the logical fallacies. They can't see the circular reasoning. And it's just, I just, at some point, I just want to scream. So, so this series to me represents a lot of that because it's just so confusing. So we're going to try, we're not going to finish it tonight. Because I am going to go with my original, my original plan was I'm going to take this article and each episode will only cover one point, right? Because there are five things that supposedly hinders the presence of Christ, all right? So I'm going to put this all back together, but I am going to say something positive because that all sounds very negative. That sounds very negative. I know because by the end of the year, I was just like, I'm just, I was just exhausted. I'm just like, what am I even doing? Like, you know, like I'm trying to speak. Sometimes I feel like the way I talk is so different than the way the rest of Christianity operates that sometimes it just feels like, what, what am I doing? Why, why do I have a podcast about theology dealing with things related to Christianity when I'm speaking to a Christianity that I don't even feel at home in? I feel an alien. I feel like an alien to it. And so Sometimes you just like whatever, but but that's all negative. Let me say something positive. Right, just a just a few. I say how long? What? Eight minutes ago, about not eight and a half minutes ago, I reached over and I hit I you know used the uh, touchpad on the laptop and then clicked on start streaming. And immediately, of course, I'm live on the internet on the Church One app, the Sermons 2.0 app, and then give it about two to three minutes, we go live on the Spreaker app and other platforms. And tonight, and I know this has nothing to do with anything, but I just want to say something positive. When I clicked on that tonight, once again, I, I can't explain to you the sense of amazement, the sense of wonder that hits me Whenever I do that, I know this sounds ridiculous. I know this may sound cheesy, but just, just hear me out. I just think it's amazing that because of technology, that at any time in the morning, afternoon, evening, late at night, or one in the morning, two in the morning, at any time, I literally have the ability to press a button and go live on the internet to talk about Bible, doctrine, theology, express frustration, uh, being upset, whatever. I can just express anything and hopefully there's someone out there that it will benefit to. And that technology to me is amazing. It means that the, I, and, and please, I hope this makes sense. The voice of Christianity is not limited to the select few, right? Because like when, when early in my Christian life, the voice of Christianity was reduced to whoever you could see on TV 
or whoever you heard on Christian radio. And it was, and no matter which radio station you went, you pretty much got the basic people, right? You got uh, Charles Swindoll, you've got John MacArthur, you know, you've got Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel. You know, you you had these certain programs, right, that, that was pretty standard. J. Vernon McGee, you had just certain programs that aired, right? And they were the voice. And, and anybody else who did not have that money or the ability to get on radio, right, you were just silenced. Now, now if someone came to your church... Or if you were able to get your message out some other way, but in 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 our current time of living, there there are many voices to Christianity, and I hope that my voice, even though it is contrary to maybe the template that you're supposed to follow in Christian broadcasting or in Christian podcast world, I hope that there I I know. I, I I think that there is room for a, a kind of an alternative voice. Look, I, when I say an alternative voice, I'm an alternative voice that still holds to historical, biblical Christianity. It's just my trying to apply that that historical, biblical, sound theological truths sometimes seems to put me at odds with the world of Christianity. But I think there has to be room for that. I know in Christian radio there wasn't room for that because I was kicked off the air. So, so clearly there wasn't room for me on Christian radio, but I, I'm glad, but it's just amazing to me that I can just turn on, I can just go live whenever I want. And if people have the church one app, they literally can be notified whenever I'm going live on the, I know, I know in our, our culture with all the technology that most people just take it for granted. Yeah. Big deal. You can go live. Who can't, right? Everyone can. But to me, it's still just amazing because I, I don't like. I don't like when when uh, the the voice of something is controlled by the select few. I like when there's alternative voices out there using the technology to speak and to and to try to well get truth out there. All right, so I don't know. I, I think it's a positive thing. You you can you can see what you think, but I say all of that to get to this piece of paper. <laughs> This series has been reduced to this piece of paper. That's what it's been reduced to, right? It's actually an envelope. It's an envelope where I got my latest, uh, my latest, uh, see, which, which devotional did this, came into this envelope? Oh, feature, a daily Bible study guide for January to March 2023, all right? So this envelope there, but I wrote down in pencil, really what this series comes down to. All right, here we go. All right, so we've been talking about this idea of God's presence. And this is a phrase that is thrown out in Christianity all the time. Do you feel the presence of God? And it, and of course, it'll be some praise service where the lights are turned down and they're singing a cappella, and everyone's got their hands raised. Don't you feel the spirit is here? Don't you feel his presence? And so this, the presence of God now is really attached to some kind of emotion or some kinds of feeling or God is present with you. God is present here. It's just, we talk about God's presence that he's present, that, that, he is, that his presence is here with us. And it's, it's thrown about so much that I don't think anyone ever takes notice or stops to go, wait, what are we actually talking about? So we listened to a, we reviewed a sermon, if you remember, from Adrian Rogers, the late Adrian Rogers. And uh, that was crazy and insane. And that was in Exodus and it was just nuts. And while we were reviewing that sermon, Literally at the exact same time, at the exact same time I'm logging into my iPad, the Christian Post posted an article entitled, Five Things That Hinder the Presence of Christ. And as we started working through this article, and based off that sermon that we reviewed, you put it all together, and it seems that within the Christian world, when we talk about the presence of God, the presence of Christ, it really goes like this, if you want to write this down. Number one, there is the omnipresence of God, the omnipresence of Christ, that God is present everywhere at all times. He is everywhere. So he is present everywhere at all times. He is omnipresent, the omnipresence of 
God. All right? We're very familiar with that doctrine, and I, I am assuming all Christians affirm that, but you never know what you're going to hear in the world of Christianity. But God is omnipresent. The omnipresence of Christ, the omnipresence of God, he's with, uh, he is everywhere at all times, all right? Everyone seems to affirm that, but we always go within Christianity a step further. There is the omnipresence of God, but there is the special presence of God. And an example would be God Shekinah glory there in the tabernacle or there in the temple, that he manifests himself in some special way. This is not a normal thing. It's a special way. And typically we, we see this in certain elements in the, in the Bible. At certain times he shows in some kind of way. He manifests in some way, shape, or form. All right, we understand that. Most Christians agree that in the, in the Bible, okay, in the Bible, at different times, God manifested himself in a special way. I think, I think we can agree to that. Number three, so there's the omnipresence, there's the special presence, and then number three, the internal presence. Now, this is the idea that as Christians, we are indwelt by God in the person of the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. He's inside all of us and that every Christian has it. Now, I know there are those who would argue you don't receive the Holy Spirit. It's subsequent to salvation. You get saved. Then you have to receive the Holy Spirit. And then if you receive the Holy Spirit, that is evidenced by speaking in tongues. You don't speak in tongues. You don't have the Holy Spirit, which is bizarre because the Bible seems to indicate if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I'm not saved because everyone has the Holy Spirit, but it is the kind of it's called, sometimes referred to as the doctrine of subsequence that it's subsequent to your salvation. And then you seek the Holy Spirit, you pray for it. And now sometimes it may happen right at salvation that you get saved, you start speaking in tongues, and then now you have the Holy Spirit. But there's, there's, that's very much in certain elements of the charismatic world. Obviously, we reject it. But the bottom line is, it is very common. It, it's a common teaching within Christianity that now some may say some don't have it and you can get into that whole argument, but it's commonly understood that if you are a believer, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Omnipresence, special presence, and we'll call the third one the internal presence. Now you think that would be enough trying to keep that straight. So when you're thinking of those three, you're like, wait a minute. So wait, so God is present. Like, wait, now, now we're saying God is present. Well, he's always present. Well, now he's present in a special way. So he's present in a special way. And how do you know he's present in a special way? Because of the mood lighting and the right kind of music sparked an emotion. And so now he's like, so, so how do we understand the special presence? Um, he's he's in, internally present inside of us. But then there's the idea where you can lose his presence or you, you have to seek his presence. And you're like, well, how does this all fit with his omnipresence, his special presence, and his uh, internal presence? How does all of that fit? But we found out there is another presence, okay? There is the omnipresence, the special presence, the internal presence. And supposedly, we, we refer to this as an extra presence, but I think what we've discovered is, at least according to some Christians, there is what we would call a surrendered presence. That if you really want this extra presence, you have to surrender. And if you surrender completely, then you get God's presence plus. It's like Disney plus. It's like Apple TV plus. It's, it's all the plus streaming services. Well, it's God's presence plus. Yes, he's internally indwelling you in the person of the Holy Spirit. But wait, there's more. You get a extra press. And I don't even know how this works. You get an extra. Well, God is already indwelling me. But somehow you get an extra presence. This is just convoluted nonsense to me. You get an extra presence if you will surrender. And a lot of this came directly from Andrew Murray's book, Absolute Surrender. Now, when I first started reading the article, I didn't realize they were going to reference Andrew Murray, but immediately, as, as soon as I started reading it, I'm like, this is from Andrew, this is from Andrew Murray, this is Andrew, I know where this is coming from. So I'm going to re remind you a little bit of the beginning of the article, and then we're going to cover the next point here. Here we go. 
and the Christian Post decided to reload the page. All right, here we go. Five things that hinder the presence of Christ. We've covered a number of them. We won't review them. I'll just mention them here in a minute. This is how the article begins. Most believers understand that God is everywhere, or there's the omnipresence, but the Bible is also clear that the power and presence of Christ can fill the heart of the believer who completely surrenders to him. There is the absolute surrender by Andrew Murray concept right here, right? His presence changes everything. So it's no secret why the enemy of our souls wants to hinder his presence and power in our lives. So please note, he's present everywhere. He's already inside of us and dwelling us in the person of the Holy Spirit. But there is, as they say, there is a, um, a, there is a presence that can fill the heart of a believer who completely surrenders to him. There's some special extra presence, which this is just, crazy. There's no, like, even trying to theologically explain this, right? And they say, here are five things that will hinder the presence of Christ in your life. The first thing that supposedly will hinder the presence is secret sins hinders his presence. We won't go back and, and look at all of the things that they said about that. Number two, uh, is, if I can cover the ad up. Number two, the fullness of the flesh hinders his presence. The fullness of his flesh hinders his presence. And this is where they quoted Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray once said, only in a life of moderation and self-denial will there be sufficient heart and strength to pray much. All right, so we, we could talk about all that. But the second thing that will hinder this, now this is the extra presence. And the extra presence is where you get power. The extra presence is where your Christian life really kicks in. Or to use that very worn out cliche, this is when you take it to the next level. When you take, I don't even know what that means. You, We need to take our Christian life to that next level. See, you're down here, but we got to go to the next level. And the next level is an absolute surrendered life. And then boom, you get the extra presence of God. Now you have boom, extra power. And then boom, you go to the next level and then boom. Boom, I don't know what happens, okay? But that's the way it's supposed to work. So number one was, if you remember, secret sins hinder his presence. Number two, the fullness of the flesh hinders his presence. Number three, a lack of desperation hinders his presence, which brings us to number four tonight, a lack of fervency hinders his presence. A lack of fervency hinders his presence. Now, the way they seem to be articulating this is, remember, it, he's omnipresent, so he can't hinder the omnipresence of, Christ, of God or of Christ. He's indwelling us in the person of the Holy Spirit, so this can't really hinder that. This is hindering um, the surrendered presence. So any of these things means a lack of surrender, and a lack of surrender, you lose the extra presence. And now the, one of the things that will do so is a lack of fervency in your life or a lack of fervency in my life. Now, immediately, if you've, been, if you've been paying attention to our study on law and gospel, you have to know, you have to know how much of this is so law-based. You got to do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. If you do this, you lose the presence. Do this. You got to do this to get it back. It's all action, 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 action that you must do. And if you'll do the actions right, then you get the extra presence now you get power, which is just crazy because that means you're doing all of these other things somehow in your own power so that you can access the greater power. And this is a, this is a common thing that we're seeing in the evangelical world. That, like, hey, there's this supernatural power, but you've got to do things in your power to access that power because that power is locked in a safe somewhere on the top of a mountain and you've got to try to crawl the mountain and fight off all the enemies, the demonic enemies that are keeping you from that power. But if you can fight through and you can get to the safe and unlock it, dun, 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 now you have the power. And it just seems like, well, if I have all of the power to do all of this, to get that power, what good is that power since I've already had plenty of power to get to it? I don't know, but it's just, none of this makes any sense, but this is just the way Christians talk. So let's find out what a lack of fervency looks like. Here we go. Let's be clear here. The spiritual battle in which the Christian is engaged is fierce. 
Satan is intent upon destroying the presence of Christ from our lives. Whoa. Satan is intent on destroying the presence of Christ in our lives. Can Satan destroy the presence of Christ in your life? So now this is not only about getting the extra presence. Now this is about us fighting a war to keep the presence that we already have. Which presence can I lose? Can I lose the internal presence? That would mean I can lose my salvation. Are you saying I can be saved and lose the Holy Spirit? Okay, well now I've got I've got I've got a lot of questions. I can't lose the omnipresence, right? Are you saying I'm losing the special presence? But the special presence seems to be something God chose to do, not something that we have any any say so in. So which presence am I losing? This seems to be the idea that I guess I'm losing the spe- the extra presence or the surrendered presence. So that Satan is out there, okay, what we have to do, guys, like Satan had a meeting. All right, guys, here's our plan in 2023. We have got to destroy the presence of Christ and the life of believers. <laughs> so, and how does he accomplish that? Typically, the way it works, he, Satan gets me Satan destroys the presence of Christ in my life by getting me not to do the right thing. So therefore, Christ's presence is determined not by his grace or mercy, but by my action and obedience, which then turns the Christian life into nothing more than, a, 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 well, an endless series of works, which I have to do in order to maintain God's presence, which sounds a lot like a salvation by works, but okay, let, let's see where they go here. All right, I'm going to read this all again. Let's be clear here. The spiritual battle in which the Christian is engaged is fierce. Satan is intent upon destroying the presence of Christ from our lives. There is no vacations from spiritual warfare. That is why the fire must be kept burning. Now, this is supposedly from a book called Fire Upon the Altar by Gene Easley, E-A-S-L-E-Y. I am not familiar with this author in any way, shape, or form. I have no idea which theological background they come from. I've never heard of this. Fire Upon the Altar by Gene Easley. Now, if my researcher is listening, go go forth and find the book and let me know. Okay. You don't have to let me know right now, but you can let me know soon. Fire Upon the Altar by Gene Easley. Now, again, this is just, so, so here's the thing. So I've got to do everything I can to get the presence. I've got to do everything I can to maintain the presence. And then I've got to do everything in my power to defend the presence because Satan wants to take the presence from me. So I got to get it. I got to maintain it. And now I've got to defend it. And, and the way I defend it is now I've got to keep the fire burning. I got to keep the fire burning because if I lose, lose my fervency, now this is how, this seems to be how fragile this extra presence is. The minute I lose my fervency, boom, the presence gone. It's like God is like, oh, you're not fervent enough, boom. And the previous point was if you're not desperate enough, boom, I'm gone. This, this, this just is a, this, I don't understand how this Christian life works in the lives of real people. It just seems like you would be in a perpetual state of, I got to try, I got to try, I got to try. Oh, I'm failing. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. It just seems like at some point you would just find yourself a lot like Luther was and just say, I I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. That's because we live the Christian life. By faith. And that's the faith that's given to us. Because by faith, I'm declared to be perfect and righteous. And that I have everything that I need. That I rest in that. And this is like, you can't rest for a second because, boom, you're going to lose the presence of God. You're going to not have power. You, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. You've got to do something. And it's, it's action, 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 law, 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 law. And a lot of people live in that. But if they're even halfway remotely honest with themselves, they would have to feel the weight of guilt because they never do enough of what they're supposed to be doing. 
Again, the name of the, so let me read this again. Let's be clear here. The spiritual battle in which the Christian is engaged is fierce. Now, I do believe we're involved in a spiritual battle. Satan is intent upon destroying the presence of Christ from our lives. I don't even know what that is supposed to mean. There are no vacations from spiritual warfare. That is why the fire must be kept burning. And so we've got to keep the fire burning. Once God lights the fire of the spirit in our hearts, we must do our parts to keep him burning through fervent prayer. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So God lights the fire and then we've got to keep the fire going. And how do we keep the fire going? We got to pray. We got to pray and we got to pray. I don't know if it's an hour a day. I don't know if it's two hours a day. I don't know if it's morning, afternoon. I don't know if it's seven times a day following the old church, uh, the litur- liturgy of the hours and the hours of prayer, which came from Judaism into the early church. I don't know what way we're supposed to do this, but we're, we have to do it. It's like, oh man, God, God lit the fire. Okay, he gave me the fire, but the fire can go out. And how does the fire of the spirit go out? Because of my failure to pray enough. Now you would think since it's the spirit of God that, um, that I would, uh, that the fire would last, right? If, 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 if God, in fact, listen to the way they describe this again. Once God lights the fire of the spirit in our hearts, we must do our part to keep him burning. We have to keep the spirit burning. Remember, it says, keep him burning. So the spirit is there and he's like, hi, I, I, and, I, and I know I'm going to be over the top ridiculous here, but I don't know how else to describe this. They're the ones using the words. Now, let me read it again to you. Once God lights the fire of the spirit in our hearts, we must do our part to keep him, and it's a capital H, keep him burning through fervent prayer. Now, now this just seems to be turned upside down. So God puts the spirit in me, and the spirit's there, and he's on fire. There's passion, there's zeal. And then all of a sudden the spirit's like, I'm getting weak. I'm getting weak. The flame is going out. The flame, the flame is going. I'm getting weaker. I'm getting weak. Oh no, I got to get to the prayer closet. I got to get to the prayer meeting. Okay, guys, I got to pray because the spirit is going out. And you pray and he's recharged. And then the fire comes back up. Now you say, well, that's ridiculous. This is how they're describing it. I didn't write this. They did. Now, from my understanding... The Holy Spirit that's in me is making intercession for me. They're seeming to say, I've got to pray to keep the Spirit active. And if I don't pray, the Spirit goes dormant. But isn't it the Spirit making intercession for me? So is the Spirit doing something for me? Or am I doing something for the Spirit? I don't know. I'm confused. They go on to say, they quote William Grinnell. Now, William Grinnell wrote the book, uh, Christian in Complete Armor, which I have now made two attempts in my Christian life to teach through those books. And I have failed miserably. <laughs> okay. I, those both times were absolute disasters, but I am still committed to figuring out a way to take those books and then just not try to teach through them. It's way too wordy. But just say, I were, today we're going to be in chapter one and just have specific quotes from the book. And then just do, I'm going to do something with it because I, I, I refuse to give up. I refuse to give up. I don't, I, no matter how many times I fail, I'm going to get back up. All right. But they quote William Grinnell. Once said, cold praying is no more prayer then a painting of a fire is fire. So now, so not only this, you got to keep the spirit burning by your prayer, but if your prayer is cold, then it's no more prayer than is painting of a fire fire. In other words, your prayer, if your prayer is cold, it's useless. How can prayers that do not burden your heart move God's hand? So now, if, you're, if your prayers do not burden your heart, you can't move God. Got to just be sitting there going, nope, sorry, you're not burdened enough. Sorry, your prayer's not good enough. Sorry, come on, come on, more passion, more zeal, more fervency. Come on, you're not doing enough. You're not praying good enough. You're not asking the right way. That This is the view that they're creating here. And then the last sentence, without desperation, 
and fervency. Prayer is like sitting in front of a picture of a fire. You see it, but you don't feel it. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and diligence takes work. So if you don't work in fervent prayer, so you got to, not only do you have to do the work, you got to do the work with fervency. Not only do you pray, you have to pray with fire. And if you don't pray with enough fire and you don't pray with enough fervency and you don't work with enough fervency, the spirit goes out. The spirit, see, the spirit is kind of temperamental, right? It's kind of like a flame. And that, that flame, if the wind comes the wrong way, it can go out. You got to relight the fire. You got to relight the fire. No, you, we got to keep that fire burning because that fire burning keeps us burning. But we are the ones. So I don't know how this works. God gives us the spirit. So I, or so this is, they're really seemingly, they're not even talking about the extra presence here. If you really think about it, they're talking about the internal presence of the Holy Spirit. The, as a Christian, I have the spirit in me. Now, the Spirit is in me, but once the Spirit is in me, that doesn't become a blessing. That becomes a burden. Because now I've got to keep the Spirit a, a flame. i got to keep the Spirit's fire lit. And I've got to do, 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 do. I've got to work. I've got to have fervency. I've got to have a fire so that I can keep the Holy Spirit's fire going. And if I don't, then I lose the fire of the Spirit in me. So it's really weird. The spirit doesn't seem to be the blessing here. The spirit seems to be the burden here because the spirit is in me. Now it's my responsibility to do all of these things to keep the spirit lit. This is a baffling teaching. I'm, I'm literally just confused and confounded on this. Like if I found this in just some obscure website, like just some weird website that I never heard of, I would just say, I would just ignore it. But this is in the Christian post for crying out loud. So in one way, the article is arguing for a surrendered presence, an extra presence from Andrew Murray and his book, Absolute Surrender. But this point seems to refer to an internal presence where God gives me his spirit. He lights it on fire Boom, 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 boom. But the fire will go out if I don't have enough fervency in my prayer, if I don't have enough burden, enough passion, enough zeal. If I'm not working enough, then the spirit will go out. So I've got to keep the spirit lit. So I, so the spirit needs me. <laughs> literally, it's, to, it's turning the, what this is doing is literally destroying that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. It's turning the Spirit into like an impersonal force that fluctuates based off what I do or don't do. This is bizarre to me. I don't even know what to do with this. So what we do need to do, and I am very interested. In fact, I'm just going to search for it right now. I'm going to search for it right now. I'm going to go because I'm just interested because I've never heard of the book. I'm going to go to Amazon right now in real time. I know you're excited about this, right? I know you're super excited. That's okay. This, this, is, this is what you're here for, right? To listen to me t- uh, tap things on my... No, let's do this. Um, let's go to Amazon. That's what we want. Let's do paste. Here it is. Oh, you can get it for free on the Kindle. All right. Fire upon the altar, a revival message. Um, It says this. The author's message both shows the need for revival in the church and gives inspiration to the reader to seek revival in his or her heart. Chapter one is entitled Padded Pews and Empty Altars. It emphasizes our need to pray. Material affluence is not the answer for our needs. We need a close relationship with God, and that relation will only be developed through communing with God in prayer. The title of chapter two, This Is That, it refers to Acts 2. Oh boy. And it's going to go to Joel chapter two. Oh man. 
All right. It's free for the Kindle. If, well, it's free if you have Kindle Unlimited. Um, if you, uh, I don't know how much it is if you don't have Kindle Unlimited. Or uh, $2.99 if you don't have Kindle Unlimited. But, um, yeah. Oh, and look what's in it. Oh, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. All right. Um, okay. Here's what's fast. I don't know on. Okay. Someone said they found it too. I'm looking at amazon.com. This is literally, this is weird to me. This is creepy. All right. So I find fire upon the altar by Gene Easley and right down. I just scroll down just a little bit and over to the right. Absolute surrender updated and annotated by Andrew Murray for free for the Kindle. There's absolute, and remember this entire article is based off Andrew Murray's article, Absolute Surrender. I'm, as soon as I started reading the article, I'm like, this is Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray. This is just, they're just not telling you that's where they're taking it from. They do quote Andrew Murray, but they never acknowledge this is from, I mean, this is just Andrew Murray repackaged. Well, that's interesting that when you, they also quote Gene Easley, and when you look up his book, Andrew Murray is right there. I mean, go figure that that's like the two go hand in hand. So maybe we need to do a little reading of Fire Upon the Altar by Gene Easley. Maybe, 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 maybe we need someone in the Discord channel to review the book in real time. Maybe we need to do that because I, I think, I think there's, I think a lot of this. Now, the person listening would, would know more than I do, but I just feel a lot of this is just repackaged charismatic stuff. That it's just like, it, this has been repacked. Well, I'll, well, okay, I'll take it back. I think there's some charismatic concept in here. I think this is a lot of this is a repackaged Andrew Murray that's been posted at the Christian Post, and it was posted on Friday, November the 25th, uh, uh, 2022. Uh, and so... So Andrew Murray, his influence has not gone away. Now, I remember at least back when I was in my first Bible Institute, at lunchtime, I would always go down to what was called Divine Truth Bookstore in Papillion, Nebraska. And uh, they uh, Andrew Murray books were all over the place. And uh, he was talked about a lot by many of the students in that Bible Institute. So I was very familiar with him. But I never, I, I always like, what is this? Uh, Char, uh, Charles, uh, yeah, Charles Stanley, greatly influenced by Andrew Murray as well. And you can hear some of Andrew Murray and Charles Stanley's teaching. So maybe we need to do a little work on both of these. Maybe we do. I don't know what to say other than this. And let me help you out. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. I do acknowledge that in the Old Testament, there were special manifestations of God in different ways at different times for different purposes because he communicated in different ways at different times before the completion of the scriptures. Today, I believe that God is internally present with every believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know how you're supposed to get an extra presence. I don't know anything about this. I don't know how I'm supposed to hinder the presence, get rid of the pre His His spirit is in me and the spirit is praying for me. And I don't have to keep the spirit going. It's the spirit that's up. That's the one operating in me. And it's really weird that this turns the responsibility of the spirit that I'm like, they all, and I know, and I'm, listen, I am by no means trying to be disrespectful, but the way this article is written, they've turned the Holy Spirit, and I hate to say it this way, but this is what the article has done. It's turned the Holy Spirit into a pet. Hey, you can get great benefits from that pet, but guess what? You have great responsibilities now from that pet, right? You got to keep it alive, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. So is it the pet really doing anything for me? Well, it, whatever the pet does for me, it's because of all the work I'm doing. So it, it just seems like it's destroying the deity of the Holy Spirit, destroying the power of the Holy Spirit and turning it into, well, the power of me. I mean, when I, when God needs me, 
to keep him a fire, his, his fire lit. We, we're in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. So this is some serious heresy. I, I got no other words to put. It's just straight up heresy. Now we have one left and we will look at it next time. The one we have left is being too busy because if you're too busy, God's out of there. God's like, oh, you're too busy. Sorry. I, I don't, sorry. Gotta go. Gotta go. You're too busy. You don't get my presence. I, I, I wish I had some profound statement to say other than this is the stuff that's just crazy. And just, just trying to follow that logic. And one of the reasons I backed up and went through this again, I, I know you're like, you've repeated these points so many times. I know, but it's really... After looking at this entire study, it comes down to this teaching somehow within the evangelical world that there's the omnipresence of God, a special presence, an internal presence, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then some kind of surrendered presence or extra presence that we that requires a mathematical formula to know if we've got it, how not to lose it, what we got to do to defend it, how to keep it, how to get it back, and, and that we can lose it, and then all this stuff, and it's just... I don't know where this idea came from, but it's convoluted. It's crazy. And I think it it's damaging in so many different ways. All right. Tomorrow we will finish, finish this series. There's a part of me that says, you know what? You've come this far. Just finish it. But I made a promise that I would cover one point in each message. I, that's the promise I made. So I'm going to keep it. And unfortunately, we'll have to finish this tomorrow. I don't want to. I don't want to, but we will. All right. Email me all your thoughts about all of this. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right. I'm going to check something really quick before I sign off. Because I like to look and just see how we're doing. Wow, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good with numbers tonight. Not great, but doing pretty good. Pretty good. I like to see the live numbers. Uh, always remember, if you would like to keep up with everything we do, the Church One app, Church O-N-E for Apple or Android device, Church O-N-E. Download the app. Do a search for Theology Central. Choose us as your selected broadcaster. Make sure all your notifications are on. You'll be notified every time we go live. You'll be notified every time we upload a new sermon. And we're and I still have to go back and be uploading older stuff. So we we're, we're, we'll continue to work on that. And uh, then you can see all of our content broken down into series, which is so much better than the average podcast app where you just start scrolling back going, wait, what was that message? Wait, where is part five of this 700 part series? You can just pick the series and go, there's part one, there's part two, there's part three, there's part four, there's part five, and it's nice and neat and organized. So there you go. And if you have any questions, always email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, because I always try to respond as soon as possible. And uh, if you need me to cover something, we'll, we'll, I'll let you, you know, I will turn on the microphone and definitely do that. And we will do a little bit of work maybe I don't know so much on the Andrew Murray book, but maybe this other book we'll do a little bit of work on, Fire on the Altar, because I am curious to, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of what, I, it, it's just, I, I, maybe it's just another repackaged version of Andrew Murray's Absolute Surrender. Maybe Andrew Murray had far greater influence than anyone ever thought or wanted to admit. And I believe the influence is detrimental and I believe it's very much law-based and not gospel-based. Uh, and if you can listen to our series on understanding law and gospel to get a better idea. All right. For the Bible study exercise this week, it's Zephaniah. We covered that very, uh, I think we did, mo I did most of the work last night. So you can listen to the latest episode of the Bible study exercise uh, podcast series. And um, I think... I think we're going to kind of finish up our study on fear this week. I, I don't know what we'll do for broadcast. And then we uh, we may do one special week on Psalm 139. And then I don't know. Then we're going to, I don't know what we're going to do next. We, 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 we'll, we'll get a plan and then we'll get all situated and uh, see what, 
what big things are on the horizon for the Bible study exercise. All right. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a wonderful night. God bless.